All right, today's giveaway is fun. This is a fun one. Maps Aesthetic for free for one of you lucky viewers. How do you win? Here's what you do. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Talk about the seven points that we talk about in this episode with Dr. Kian Vu. He's talking about longevity, living better. Comment on that below in the first 24 hours. And if we pick your comment, you'll get free access to Maps Aesthetic. You also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Also, one more thing, Maps Strong and Maps Powerlift are both 50% off. Go check them out at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special with no space for that discount. All right, enjoy the show. All right, so Dr. Vu, thanks for coming on the show. Can you give our audience a little bit of a background uh, as to what you do before we get into our topic? Sounds great. So I was originally trained as a conventional MD as an interventional radiologist. So a lot of people don't know what that is. So radiology, you go into the hospital or a clinic, X-rays, CT scans, MRIs, ultrasounds are all these different advanced technologies that you could use to pierce inside the body. So as a diagnostic radiologist, I was able to to see pretty much all different types of diseases and what it looked like inside the body. As an interventional radiologist, I actually use that technology to do minimally invasive surgeries. So I was able to use a real-time x-ray machine to see inside the body what type of surgeries would I do. I would basically, if blood vessels are clogged up, I could put a small little tube inside a blood vessel and open them up. Got it. There were blood vessels that lead into tumors. I could, I could put a tube in there and deliver either radiation or chemotherapy in. I with a CT scan, I could see where a mass is and direct a needle into that mass and either take a sample of it, burn it, or freeze it. So as a radiologist, I was able to see lots of disease. As an interventional radiologist, I was able to treat a lot of disease, but I didn't go into longevity and performance medicine because of all these fancy technologies. I went into it because five years ago, I was trained at probably the best institutions in the country, the NIH, UCLA, UC San Diego, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'm not saying that to impress you. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that to impress upon you that five years ago, I was this doc on top of my game and I was overweight. I was diabetic. I was hypertensive. And I was taking prescription medications, not knowing that I didn't learn how to be healthy going through the path of conventional traditional medicine. And it was really that journey of understanding what health really is, that I was able to reverse my conditions in a short period of time, and now this is what I practice with my concierge clients. Wait, back up for a second for a minute. So uh, walk me through how a kid who's aspiring to be a doctor one day says, I'm gonna be an intervention radiologist. Is that yeah, what I, interventional I that? radiologist. Okay, yeah. yeah, so how do you? How does that happen? I mean, what drives you into that, 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 that field? Okay, well, great question. Well, for, for me, well, I, I have to go back even further now to my history. I was actually not born in this country. I was born a couple of years after the Vietnam War. And my parents were, were from the South and they had seized all the businesses there. And as my parents were actually Chinese immigrants to Vietnam, they took away their businesses. They took away all, all, all their money. And my parents were like, hey, you know what? We're about to have a child. I can't raise him here in this country. And so they took me. Um, and we escaped on this refugee boat. I was on a refugee boat with 2,000 other refugees. Wow. wow. Yeah. Being the only infant to survive. I spent eight months on that boat, another three months in a Philippine refugee camp. And then we were sponsored to America by a Catholic church. So yay, America. And you would think a kid growing up, you know, being the only kid to have survived this, this, this boat voyage would be very grateful. But that wasn't the case. You know, I grew up in Chinatown, LA. It was an immigrant neighborhood, but I got bused to a, a more affluent area for school. And when I went to school, I was constantly being teased for the holes in my hand-me-down clothes to the stinky food my mom, you know, sent me to school with. I used to be called chinky all the time. And so there was that energy of I'm not enough. I'm, I was constantly, I wanted to actually be like a comedian or a rock star. You know, my, my heroes were like Tony Robbins, <laughs> Robin Williams, Mick Jagger. I looked at the TV and I said, you know what? There's nobody that looks like me there. You know, there, there's no Asian um, motivational speaker or comedian. And so, and, and then I just saw these images and, you know, you know, it, this brought me back to a lot of uh, my own history when I saw a lot of the Asian hate happening around the coronavirus. Yeah. And I just remember not feeling like I was enough. You know, I had actually wanted to be that entertainer to use my voice for something, but my mom, so you say, well, how does a kid want to, you know, uh, 
uh, go into interventional radiology. My mom said, you know what, kid, son, you have three choices. You could be a doctor, an MD, or a physician. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I went to medical school. I was just going to ask you because uh, that's a very interesting experience, but it could have gone another way. You could have gone the angry you know, victim, I guess, uh, mentality, screw this, it's not, you know, worth it, I'm just gonna, whatever. But instead, you went and it sounds like you went and and busted your ass. What, so that was your parents' influence. That yeah, that was my that was my parents' influence. Why did I end up going into radiology? Well, radiology was the most sexy thing we had in medicine. I mean, you you got to play with the most advanced technologies. That's true. Being able to do a surgery uh, through a pinhole in your body was pretty damn cool. So that's mm -hmm. why I ended up choosing that. And you you mentioned this one thing, like you know, I I didn't choose the victim mentality. There is a quote from the Dalai Lama, and this is how I got chronic disease. There's a quote from the Dalai Lama. He says what he found most interesting about humanity. And as the story goes, a reporter asked him, okay, well, what do you find most interesting about humanity? He said, man, because he would sacrifice his health in order to make money. Oh, I've heard this. And mm. then sacrifice his money to recuperate his health. And that's so crazy. Right? I didn't have that victim mentality, but I had this feeling of not enough and that I was constantly needing to chase something outside of myself, right? Chasing getting into the next residency, chasing, climbing up in, 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 in the hospital. And it was always busting, 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 seeking for something outside of me. And when you get stressed out, when your body's stressed out doing that, you're going to take on bad habits, like not sleeping very well, not eating very well. And the constellation of bad habits stacked upon bad habits, that what drives a low bioenergetic state, which we could talk about in a second. And that's what leads to chronic disease. Mm. And now you were, I mean, you're obviously not an old, you're young. So you said this was how long ago? Five years ago? Seven yeah, years ago? Yeah, five years ago. So five years ago, you're doing all these things, <clears throat> diabetic, prescription medications, not healthy as a young man. Yeah. And you mentioned stress and overwork obviously contributed to that. Was there like a specific turning point? Was there a moment where you're like, okay, this is not working. I feel like every hero's journey has this little dip. And what I thought was probably the worst year of my life turned out, turned out to be the greatest gift of my life. And so I was this, you know, interventional radiologist, really thought I was at the top of my game. I was traveling around the world speaking of the advances in interventional radiology, but, you know, I had all the symptoms. Also at the same year, I needed sh shoulder surgery and I wasn't sure if I could practice anymore. I lost a close uncle to cancer. And then I lost, you know, a woman I thought I was going to marry. I was so, um, you know, uh, you know, wrapped up in succeeding, succeeding, succeeding that I neglected my relationships. And so all these things kind of happened, you know, in the same year. And I was overweight, diabetic and all those things. And I remember this one incident. I was feeling pretty sorry for myself and I was rounding the hospital and I pick up the chart for the patient I was going to see next. And I look at the chart. This is a 43-year-old male with terminal pancreatic cancer. And when you have cancer, when you have cancer cells plugging up what is your, your lymphatics in your belly, he had 10 liters of fluid in his belly. Yeah, ascites, right? That, ascites, that there you go. Uh -huh. Malignant ascites is what he had. And so I had to tap 10 liters from his belly. Mm. And I remember thinking, oh my God, okay, I, I got to put myself together. I know I'm feeling like shit, but I got to put myself together because poor, you know, poor guy is about to die. I opened the door. And I just remember, man, I, I get chills every time I, I think about it. But he looks at me with the biggest eyes and the biggest smile. Hey, Doc, how you doing, man? Thank you so much for being here, man. I'm going to feel so much better once you tap this. And I, I just remember feeling so much like love and everything that was going on in my head, I forgot about. And I had to ask him, his name was Ishmael. I asked him, Ishmael, how are you so positive now? And he says, Doc, it's easy. Well, it's not so easy because I didn't spend my entire life like this. But cancer gave me a gift. Cancer gave me the gift of knowing that no matter what life circumstances are, I always have a choice in how I show up in the world. And now I choose to show up with love. And now I choose to show up with joy. And that was the instance there. That was the defibrillator shock. Mm. I said, I was living my life in a certain way. And I've got chronic disease. I got to figure this out. I got to make new choices. And that's when I left full-time interventional radiology. Wow, that's tough because mm. you're, you've are you studied so hard. You spent so much time in this particular field. And I, you know, I want to be very clear. Western medicine's got tremendous value yeah. at treating, especially when it comes to treating acute you know, health issues, right? If you 
something's going to kill you right now. It's, you want to go to Western medicine to make sure that you don't Absolutely, die. Absolutely, right. But one thing that they tend to not do so well at currently, although I think it's going to start trending uh, in this direction, they're not very good at wellness prevention or treating chronic illness. And that's a tough realization when you spend so much time and energy in that space. Was that hard? Now, did you resist that or were you open-minded to that? Well, I knew I needed to change. And at, at the time, I didn't know, you know, any other medicines or healing modalities outside. But I started off just working on my physical habits. Like I used to not sleep very well. I used to wake up with a cup of coffee, six pumps of international de delight, double that, and then monster energy drinks throughout the day. Mm. And I wonder why I couldn't sleep at night. And I time. wake up exhausted. <laughs> well, and the truth is this, that's not, not normal for a lot of doctors. That's, that's a lot of, yeah. a lot super of, common. A lot of yeah. doctors don't eat very well, don't Absolutely. sleep very well. And how can stuff. you look at a doctor, give you medical advice when, when they're not really the epitome of health? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this at first, but once I started to do that, I started to notice a shift in my body. I was like, oh my God, I'm starting to, to actually feel better. Then I went deeper. Then there is functional medicine now. There are alternative medicines out there. I did plant medicines to, to actually go through some of the, the deep um, uh, um, <laughs> mental work. And we actually talk, I actually do some psychedelic work myself. Um, but it wasn't until I started to really understand those concepts, under, start, started to understand epigenetics. And that's the new exciting thing. Hmm. Because our DNA is not what we get from mom and dad. That's partially true. Some people think, okay, I'm going to get a disease because mom and dad had a disease. Well, it's partly true. You get a DNA from mom and dad, but it's actually, the DNA is all the plays that you could have in your cellular playbook, right? But you're not playing all those plays at the right time. In fact, you have to play the right plays at the right moment in order for you to get great health. Right. You play the wrong plays, just like in a game, you're going to lose the game. Well, what's isn't the, what's the saying go? The, the, your your DNA is what loads the gun, and then your your, your choices your yeah. choices are what pulls exactly. the trigger, right? And that's exactly it. And then if we start to understand that our cells and our DNA are constantly listening to the energetics around it, moment by moment, then we'll start to be like, okay. And here's the thing: in my book, I talk about the seven things, the seven bioenergetic things that actually tells our cells in a moment to moment basis: Are you in a very safe and thriving environment or are you in a stress or danger environment? And the thing is, the cool thing is those seven things you and I can control. We are really in control of that energetic environment that speaks to our DNA. And therefore we are in control of achieving optimal health, longevity, and peak performance or having chronic symptoms and chronic disease. Yeah, no, it's uh, I love this field. Um, it's interesting because there are actually, although genetics are connected to lots of different uh, chronic issues, there's very few uh, health issues that are completely determined by genetics. There really is, very, right. very few. There's definitely genetic issues, but there's very few that are guaranteed. Most of them are exactly you know, what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Do you feel like this puts you in a unique position because you have such an extensive you know, traditional medical and science background to then move into kind of the wellness and functional kind of health space? I didn't think so initially. I was thinking, man, you know, I was trained at all these top institutions, yet I got chronic disease. Mm -hmm. What the F? But now I could say, no, I actually went through and I've got all this traditional training. I understood diseases from um, a, a, a medical world, but you know, I was, there's a, there's a Indian parable about, you know, six blind men and the elephant, right? One of them sees the elephant and, and he feels the trunk and thinks, oh, okay, it's a snake. One of them feels the tusk and thinks this is a spear. And the idea is you don't see the entire thing. And, if, you know, when I was studying uh, Western medicine, I only looked at health from one component, but now I could see different parts. And I don't think I see everything, but I'm starting to see more and more of that elephant. And that allows me now to be able to say, hey, you know what? I went through the medical route. I am an assistant cl clinical professor at UCLA, but there are things that we don't know and there's limitations to conventional medicine. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think there's some there's some dogma that surrounds the, the Western medicine that, that keep us from excelling in that now that you've kind of dabbled in the kind of Eastern or more holistic view of looking at things? Now, looking back, do you see the, the dogma that's in that? Yeah, certainly. I, I think, you know, you know, you know, I might get reamed for, for saying this, but I mean, I, I feel like a lot of my medical education was paid for by the drug companies, mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, and it's a way of treating a symptom with, with a drug, not understanding that the root causes of a lot of disease are things that we self-inflict, mm -hmm. not knowing it when we're not conscious. 
Yeah, I, I, I look, we work in the fitness space and I can't tell you, I mean, they're constantly looking for a cure to obesity um, when obviously lifestyle, but you know, and it's, yes, I agree with you driven by pharmaceutical companies, but that's also driven by consumers because I've got, look, I had doctors, I used to train a lot of doctors back in the day when I had a personal training studio and a, a few of them were like you, very, very health focused. And they'd tell me, Sal, I tell you, man, I'll sit down with my patient and I'll tell them, we need to change your diet. You need to exercise regularly. And people don't want to yeah. do it. They just but don't if I, want to listen. Yeah, if like, I, you take this on. pill, they'll do it. Even then, actually, studies will show people often don't even take their medications. Yeah. So it's a very tough Yeah, but road. that's part of culture, though. Don't it you is. feel like that's something that we have created for ourselves? I think we have to break that cycle. I don't think that's in humans. I think that that's just how we've treated everything forever, right? Absolutely. I just feel like our modern-day society yeah. uh, links up success with all these things that are outside of ourselves. Yeah. Like, you know, links up, you know, how you should be from not being who you truly are authentically. I mean, my path of healing was really to understand why I'm here, to love myself. And my path of healing was really accepting myself, knowing who I am as a person, what I have to contribute. And we don't say that to the people growing up. It's like, okay, you need, like my mom, you need to go into this field. Mm -hmm. Let's let's take away the things that, that make you happy and, 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 and program these other things into you. And we forget who we really are. Sure. And it's that part of the remembering, you know, part of this, those seven things. Number seven is actually purpose. And purpose is remembering who we are who are and what we're meant to serve to other people. Okay, nice. so let's get into those seven, um, yeah. those seven points. And you, you referred to this as like the what did you call this? A bioenergetic. Yeah, the bioenergetic state. Okay, so so let's yeah. let's define that first. Yeah. Like, what do you mean by bioenergetic state? Okay, so um, you know, back when I was uh, you know uh, in college, I actually went to USC to study you know to study cells in a petri dish. And there are you know I study these lung cells, and there's two type of lung cells. One is a type one cell that basically lines the lung, participates in gas exchange. Then there was a type two cell, which was like a stem cell that could turn into type one cells, but and it also helps secrete something called surfactant, which keeps the lung moist. Well, we studied how these cells behaved in a petri dish, and we started to learn. Okay, well. When does this one cell differentiate into another cell? How does the cell behave? Mm -hmm. Well, when we started to change the nutrients in the medium, they started to behave different. We started to change the temperature. It's hard to, sh to shift its behavior in terms of how rapidly it divided. We changed the light and it started to change. So it turns out what determines the behavior or the state of a cell is not actually the DNA, but it's actually all the energetic environment that's around it that Got determines it. how the cell behaves. Mm -hmm. And that DNA is constantly listening, again, moment to moment with all that energetic environment, right? And what controls that environment? Everything, because you, you, your DNA is constantly listening, but to, to learn everything and think there's an infinite amount of things that affects yourselves isn't gonna help you or me. But there are actually seven main things in the book. Sleep, nutrition, movement, emotional and stress mastery, relationships and purpose, our thoughts and mindset, those seven things is the 80-20 rule or the 90-10 rule as to whether or not you can be in the thrive state, which gives you access to optimal health, longevity, and peak performance. Or if your cells think you're in stress because you haven't mastered those mm -hmm. seven things, they think that you're in actually a stress or danger state. That's when inflammation increases, immunity decreases. That's when you have chronic symptoms. That's when you get chronic disease. This, this totally supports the studies on longevity where they'll, they'll notice that, you know, people in this particular part of the world live on average 10 or 15 or even 20 years longer than people in this part of the world. It must be their genetics. Then what they'll do is they'll follow their offspring that move to a different part of the world. Within one generation, their lifespan matches the place that they live. Cause as, as soon as they start to follow that particular lifestyle. So it wasn't the genetics, it was Absolutely. all the other stuff. So how did we how did we distill down to these seven? Was it something that you were watching with the cells when you guys were studying them or how did you distill down to these seven? Well, so when I was studying the cells, it was really one of the earlier, um, you know, at least for me in, in my career, knowing that the environment is actually what controls the cellular behavior. Then I started, you know, as I as I healed myself, I started to do more work into epigenetics, studying telomeres, working with epigeneticists. And you'll notice now, a lot of people are like, well, what's the cure for depression? Oh, sleep, exercise, yeah. nutrition. Oh, what, what's what's the cure for, um, you know, diabetes? Well, sleep, exercise. Yeah. You started to study all these things and you started to see patterns, like the root cause of a lot of these things. So here, here we are. So 
Our individual cells, cells make up tissues, make up organs, make up organ systems that make up who we are, right? So we want optimal health and longevity and peak performance. Well, we need optimal cells for that. When our cells start to break down, if our cells um, are suboptimal, that leaves the suboptimal tissues, suboptimal organs, suboptimal systems. If you have a suboptimal cardiovascular system, atherosclerosis, heart attack, stroke, suboptimal uh, uh, endocrine system, diabetes, suboptimal immune system, you get cancer, autoimmune disease. Um, so that's what determines you know, whether or not we're on the positive side of the coin of optimal health, longevity, and peak performance and not uh, is mastering that bioenergetic state. All right, let's start with the, the first one you mentioned was sleep. Yeah. So let's talk about that one for a second. Uh, why, first off, I think it's widely understood or I guess common knowledge that in modern societies or modern times, we tend to suffer from poor sleep. Uh, why? What is, why is sleep such an issue? How, and was it better in the past? It was certainly better in the past. I, I believe it's our modern lifestyle and how we're living our, our life that people are programmed to not do things that we were naturally meant to do as human beings, right? Uh, beginning with sleep. Why are people not sleeping so much? Well, there's a lot of chronic stress that's out there. We've got a lot of blue light now that suppresses melatonin. Um, so people aren't sleeping very well because of that. Um, and so why is sleep so important? Well, sleep is one of those things that is important for our circadian rhythm, right? So when we sleep, uh, our body rejuvenates. We get rid of a, a lot of toxins that are in our central nervous system and we, we, we get replenished. And it also resets our circadian rhythm, which is the master clock that our hormones use, right? So when, our, when your hormones are off, try losing weight. That's not going to happen, right? Our hormones drive everything. So if people aren't sleeping very well, your body's going to think you're going to be in, in a stress state. You have a chronic elevation in cortisol. Everything kind of like falls apart. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that, about sleep is that you think it's it's an it's well on its surface it's evolutionarily disadvantageous to sleep right you're you're eight hours you're not doing anything you're super vulnerable to attack something can kill you why do we sleep obviously it's that important yeah. otherwise evolution would have figured it out and we would have stopped sleeping by now so it's super super uh, important you mentioned chronic stress. Now, I think when I go back, I'm going to play devil's advocate, right? It, it was must have been super stressful 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. I got to watch out for predators and foods hard to, you know, hard to find and maybe you know, a tribe attacked us. What's the difference between the stress then and the stress now? What do you mean by chronic? Well, that's a great question. So back in the day, we got stressed when there was a saber-toothed tiger behind us or when the neighboring village was about to come attack. That was stress. When they weren't around, we went back just like the animals. It, when, when there's a lion around, they, they get you know, into their parasympathetic state, they run away, and then they'll go back to grazing. Stress this day, who's the saber-toothed tiger today? A bad text from, from, from a friend, right. or like a Twitter post that's, that's, that's like- And they happen all the time. You off. Right? Yeah, or somebody really. cutting you off on the freeway. Yeah. All those things are acting like that saber-toothed tiger to you. And the thing is the stress response is a good response because it will increase your heart rate and um, increase uh, blood flow to, to your muscles so that you could run away from, from an actual threat. It causes your blood to thicken because if a saber-toothed tiger were to bite you, you can claw it off right away. But because all that blood gets diverted to your muscles, your visceral organs that are that's important for life, it doesn't get that blood flow, right? You've got inflammation to increase because if you get a flesh wound, you you want your body to come come and attack that 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 flesh wound. So inflammation increases, and who needs an immune system when you're about to be lunch? So your immune system drops at that point. So your immune system goes up. You're basically setting up all that in that environment or the, all that energy that that's used, you know, uh, for growth and healing gets diverted into the stress response. Mm. And because we are chronically, you know, responding to that stress, our body is not, you know, meant to, to handle that stress day in, day out, all day. That's right. the problem. And then, of course, how can you sleep when right. you've got this kind of chronic? So do you have any takeaways or steps for improving your sleep quality or the time? First of all, I've heard, I've, I've read that seven to nine hours is ideal for most people. Yeah. Is that true? And then, how do you improve the quality of your sleep right now in the context of modern life? Yeah, so great question. Um, seven to nine hours is generally enough. And you'll, you'll know if you ask yourself, you know, like during the day, uh, 
are, do you feel well rested or are you not, you know, uh, well rested? So you'll gauge. And here's the other thing is when you start to, you know, do some of the other things uh, in, in the, um, uh, the other seven bioenergetic elements, you'll notice that maybe you need a little bit less sleep, but generally it's around seven to nine hours. Okay. Now, I look throughout the day because a good night's sleep really begins in the morning. So when I get up in the morning, I usually go right outside. The first thing I do is to get 20 to 30 minutes of natural sunlight in my eyes, in my skin. It tells my circadian rhythm, it's time to reset, it's time to wake up. You get a, a small boost of cortisol when you do so. Throughout the day, here's the other thing I didn't used to do is, you know, and we can go through this a little bit later as to what I do during the day, but I always like every like couple of hours, I would check in to bring my body back into a paras parasympathetic state. You're, it's not when, but you know, how is the day gonna, gonna like bump up your stress levels? And it's understanding that you need to manage your stress levels kind of throughout the day, right? So I do breathing techniques, I do a little meditation. I know I'm not going to drink coffee or al actually, you know, uh, quit on drinking alcohol altogether. I won't drink any of that past 2 p.m. because the caffeine could, could linger around in your body. At night, um, I do have a, a pair of blue blocking glasses I'll put on around 6, 7 p.m. At night, I'll have a routine. And it's really, for me, I like to have little, little ceremonies with myself. And, you know, this, this happens with meditation. This happens with my nighttime routine. I'm journaling uh, things that make me happy. I'm journaling the things that I'm, I have to think about the next day so that it's out of my brain onto a piece of paper. Um, and then, uh, then I spend a little bit of time, you know, uh, cuddling up with my partner and, uh, and, and off we go. Justin's now, a big cuddler. Yeah. yeah. Adam, yeah. <laughs> Adam loves that about him. People what love cuddling me. Now, now the, the, what about the temp? I've heard the temperature of the room is important to keep it yeah. cool. Uh, keep it real dark. These are all important factors. Absolutely. In improving your sleep. Yeah. So uh, some people are really, really sensitive to light, but keeping the um, keeping the room as dark as possible is great. I also sleep on a chili pad that actually brings down. Yeah, we the work with them. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great company. Yeah. yeah. So Jesus, and Felix, great. Well, if we do enough, we could hit it like five sponsors here in this episode. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're on a roll. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, it, may, it makes a big difference. Uh, you know, I, I a question that I have just around sleep is uh, revolving around snoring or sleep issues now mm -hmm. short of getting a sleep study because i think that's ideal right you go do a sleep study but you got to sleep in a lab they watch you do the whole thing are there signs to look out for to say to see if maybe you're not getting enough oxygen while you're sleeping or maybe you're having issues with you know yeah, that you might have apnea or something yeah like that. Yeah. yeah well certainly uh well a few things. One, are you tired during the day? Mm. All right. So that's that's a, a good question to ask. Two, if you have a partner that is sleeping with you that's actually, you know, observing you, are you snoring a lot? Are there times where they're like, oh, you know what? You know, it seems like you can't catch your breath. You would snore and then you would stop breathing for a little oh, bit. Crap. So so that that's 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 I thought a my wife was too, just complaining. Right. <laughs> um, the other thing you could do is relatively cheap. You could actually get a, a finger um, oxygen saturation level, oh, right? You, you can get those for less than 10 bucks and you could wear that and have somebody else observe what your oxygen levels are at night. I don't know mm. But um, but those things, daytime sleepiness plus snoring or, or somebody observing that you're not sleeping very well, that should maybe, you know, hint that maybe you should now go sleep ahead and positions. Get a does that matter as much or is this just a personal preference? It depends on each person. So it depends depending on your anatomy, because you'll the problems that, that people get with sleep apnea is if you happen to have a lot of tissue in your soft palate and if you happen to have a pretty thick tongue and maybe a thick neck like I did, um, certain positions will, you know, uh, obstruct that airway a little mm -hmm. bit more. So you kind of have to experiment. You know what I found interesting about that? This is not, so, you. it's more common in people that are obese and overweight. Yeah. But I have, actually have a client just got a sleep yeah. test. And uh, Christine, you guys know, she's yeah. in, in phenomenal shape. Mm -hmm. yep. And actually she has severe sleep apnea. Yeah. She had no idea. Have building, uh, believe it or not, building a muscular neck, uh, I've heard can contribute yeah. to that. Um, so it's kind of interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so after sleep, which I, I agree is extremely important, what would be the next one that you- Okay, so do? the next thing is nutrition. Nutrition. All right, yeah. let's talk about that. There's lots of controversy around yeah. nutrition. We deal with this all the time. Mm -hmm. What are the staples in nutrition from a health longevity standpoint? Can we first address though, like how much yeah. knowledge most doctors Thank have in you. nutrition? Yes. Coming from close a to nothing, okay, yeah. we, we got nothing in medical school. It's like a semester, right? Yeah. No, it wasn't even a semester. Wow. I don't even remember <laughs> getting a lecture. I mean, I yeah, Did, I skipped some it, lectures. Don't, you <laughs> find that, I, I just find that crazy or ironic, or is it our it's fault as a blowing. society just to assume that doctors have all this nutritional? That was as a trainer, that was one of the hardest things being a you know twenty three year old. Yeah. 
fitness trainer and then I've got doctors that were giving terrible nutrition advice to my clients. And then of course I lose that battle all day long because right. I don't have the PhD. Yeah. So uh, letting looking in front of the camera now, look, the, the traditional MD doesn't get a lot of training and um, you know, fortunate to, to have podcasts like this, for, you know, that people start to understand, you know, how important nutrition is to, you know, to, uh, to your health. And yeah, we didn't get that. And so I, I didn't, I had to do all that training after I got disease and start to understand, okay, what I need to put in my mouth mm -hmm. and, and, and how important the role is. Uh, nutrition in, in terms of like, so share is medicine, share that journey. Then yeah. what was that like for an MD educated person? Mm -hmm. And now you're going to start heading down the nutrition path. Yeah. Uh, did you have some pitfalls? Did you, did you see some, did you try some specific diets or like, how did that all come together for you? Yeah. So uh, it initially just started not doing the sad diet, which is the standard American diet. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, I actually went vegan for a little bit and that actually improved my symptoms but only to a certain point, you know, I, I started to find out, you know, to discover that I started to get a little bit tired and things like that. Uh, and I, I, my, my body was craving the protein. So I went vegan for a little bit. Then I started to take in meats again, but then I started to take in the quality meats. Right. So a lot of it was just ditching the standard American diet, which is just ditching sugar, ditching processed foods. Um, and sticking to pretty much a whole food, minimally processed uh, situation that that I, you know, I use to kind of reverse, you know, my chronic conditions. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you said that about going vegan, and you initially felt some uh, improvement. This is the pitfall that a lot of people run into: is they'll try a diet, and they'll start to see some improvement, and they'll think it's about the diet, when in reality, it's about probably the reduction in calories. So you probably went vegan and ate less. And eating less, typically, if you're eating in a calorie surplus Or you surplus eliminated before. some crap that you Yes, do. that's yes. the main that's thing. Yeah. That's I think most take. people are just eating crap. That's yes. what it is. So, so I, eliminating well, the crap. I, that, well, that, that's my experience. My yeah. experience, I would tell a client that you would fall in love with any said diet. It could be the vegan diet, carnivore diet, paleo, whatever. And, oh, my God, so magical. It's like, well, let's look at what you were doing before. You're not eating donuts anymore. And, yeah, and what yeah. you do now. And it's more likely that you were doing something that was probably a gross offender and your body didn't like. Right. And now you're not. Mm -hmm. more so than it is this magical yeah. diet. Are there are there down. general things around nutrition when it comes to creating this this positive bioenergetic state? Uh yeah, I think that the key things are like I said, getting rid of the sugar, getting rid of the processed foods, including good healthy fats, coconut oil, avocado, olive oil um, is good. Um, the meats that you choose, I think are going to be important, uh, because there are meats, industrial raised meats that are going to be more inflammatory than re the meats that are like grass fed or sustainably, you know, raised fish, mm -hmm. uh, pasture raised chicken and, and, and pork. Um, you mentioned coconut oil. It's yeah. super high in saturated fat. Yeah. So, and, and now we've talked about saturated fat and some mm -hmm. of the myths surrounding it. So yeah. why, why, why recommend, uh, an oil that's so high in saturated fat when, we're told so often to completely avoid, at least we were told so often to avoid that. Yeah, well, we were told, you know, uh, to avoid that because back in the day, people really thought that LDL was the main issue in terms of, you know, cardiovascular events. Uh, that that story is starting to, to change a little bit. So saturated fat will raise your LDL levels, and I noticed that uh, as well. But one, I found I was more satiated when I ate more uh, saturated fat. It will bump up your LDL levels a little bit, but people need to you know, dive in a little bit deeper. If your LDL goes up, there are factors that are more important than just the LDL alone. How fluffy your LDL particles are make a big difference. So if you have nice, fluffy LDL particles, that's not atherogenic. Um, uh, your particle number is going to be super mm. important as well. So if you've got lots of very tiny particles, they are more atherogenic than than uh, when you have like you know uh, a, a lower LDL number. So all these things play play an important role. So I mean, people were demonizing saturated fat before because. Uh, they didn't want to demonize sugar at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know the sugar industry, actually, that came out that they actually spent money on that. Yep. There was a famous study, too, where they took uh, a group of, this was actually quite controlled, where they took a bunch of people, cut out their saturated fat intake, replaced it with uh, processed vegetable oils, and they did lower everybody's cholesterol. And then later on, when they followed them yep. along, they actually saw their mortality increase. So they had lower cholesterol numbers, but they Absolutely. had higher mortality in this particular study. <laughs> yeah, I think they were using corn oil. Yes, they were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> Very I, interesting. So I think I think the story with LDL is uh, is a little bit incomplete, and we're starting to understand it's not just the LDL alone. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's cool. And I, I, I will say this. You mentioned this earlier about pharmaceutical companies driving a lot of what we learn. 
We have a drug that very reliably lowers cholesterol, and I think that's part of the reason why we've placed so much focus on cholesterol, because we have an easy solution. Oh, high cholesterol? Take this pill. And the, I, there are some benefits in certain situations. The studies are, are quite clear on that, but I think it's... I mean, it's got it's so much more complex than that, right? It, it, it is absolutely more complex than that. And, and just to let people know, I mean, a couple of years back, I was thinking, oh, we should put this, you know, everybody should be on this. You I've know, heard that. Put statins it'll, in the water. Yeah, it'll, it'll lower your, your cholesterol levels. It's also kind of like uh, anti-inflammatory, but people don't tell you that years of taking it, it, it will affect, you know, your, your muscles. You know, it can, you know, cause, you know, uh, esophagitis. It will cause, you know, muscles to kind of leak. Um, you know, uh, cause your muscle to be inflamed. So it's it's not, you know, if, if you got early stage and your, your cholesterol is just a little bit elevated, go the lifestyle route. Mm. You know, if you got a, a heart attack and you kn you've got tons of plaque, okay, fine. Mm. Maybe start there and also use the lifestyle stuff. All right, so it was sleep, nutrition, what's next? Uh, you know, movement. What you guys do, movement. Yeah. We probably don't need to go into too much detail because you're, you're, you're <laughs> well, your people. Probably well, I'd love to hear yeah. from you yeah. uh, more specifics about movement. Now, I'm looking at you. You obviously uh, work out, and you probably it looks like you do some resistance training. Yeah. Are there better forms of movement uh, versus others? In other words, if someone only has a couple days a week to devote to exercise, are there some that you found to be more beneficial than others? Uh, great question. So I think as we age. You know, including some kind of resistance um, exercise, whether it be weightlifting, whether it be using your body weight is so important because sarcopenia or the lack of muscle mass as we age is a big um, indicator of, 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 you know, not doing so well when you get a little older. Having more lean muscle body mass actually um, is tied to longevity. So that's super important, particularly as you get older, even when, when you feel like you're, you're a little bit weaker. I like to include um, sprinting a week, doing an all out sprint, um, and uh, occasionally throw in some high intensity interval training. Oh, very yeah. cool. So that's the movement part. What's next? Uh, the next part is emotional and stress mastery. Okay. So this one's uh, this one's interesting, right? Because I most think, people suck at it. That's yeah. I mean. Well, also because I think people think that stress mastery means no stress at all, but it's, stress is important too, right? Like exercise is a stress on the body. You have right. to have that stress, right? Same Getting sunlight that yeah. stresses your skin out a little bit and your body out, but there's obviously positives to it. What do you mean by stress mastery? Yeah. So it's understanding that there are um, emotional states that lead to inflammation. So there's basically a couple of emotions in, in our body, right? And if your body thinks you're in stress, what happens? It turns on the stress or danger response. There's actually a, um, a gene sequence that's in your DNA that whenever it senses that your cells are in danger, it'll turn that on. And what happens? Everything we talked about with the saber tooth tiger, right? Mm -hmm. Inflammation goes up, immunity goes down. Long term, that sets you up for chronic um, symptoms and chronic disease. So emotions like anger, like fear, like worry, like anxiety, like resentment, all those emotions, those low vibrational emotions actually causes that stress response to turn on. On the flip side, the emotions of love, of gratitude, of connection, um, of laughter is anti-aging. And they actually have biochemical responses that lead to increased length of telomeres and the exact opposite, they're anti-aging. So you need to understand that, that you know, if I am in anxiety and worry constantly, I mean, they're cues to your body. You can use them as signals in your body, but if that's the predominant emotion of, of what your body might be going and, and what you're feeling day in and day out, you're actually driving the stress response. You know, Dr. Vu, I'm going to make a statement I'd love your comment uh, on or your feedback on. So, yeah, I think about this a lot. Like, why is it so easy and natural for us to experience those negative uh, or unhealthy emotions? And why is it so challenging to to find sometimes those positive emotions? And the best uh, that I can come up with is that those negative emotions tend to be more reactionary. So it's an, it's automatic. Anger is automatic. Fear is automatic. Whereas the other ones require a little bit more consciousness, you know, sometimes. I mean, it can be automatic too, but sometimes I have to like put myself there. Is that, is that, would you say that's accurate? I would say that's pretty accurate. And the, the thing is, we, you know, if we think of all the thoughts that we think of on a day to day or second to second basis, 70, 80% of those thoughts are going to be negative. Why is that? Well, evolutionary, being able to be 
to worry about certain things or fearing certain things kept us safe. And so that's why those thoughts are there. You know, they're used to keep us safe, but you know, you don't have to believe your thoughts. And actually most of your thoughts aren't true. And you can start to, you know, you can't control those thoughts from coming in. What you can control is how you decide to focus the thoughts, what type of meaning you put into the thoughts, which is the next category up, which is, you know, our thoughts and mindset. Because you could have a negative inflammatory thought that when you focus on increases the stress response, increasing inflammation, lowering your immunity and putting you in chronic disease. And he, why do we spend so much time in those negative things? People aren't trained or know that, okay, I don't have to believe my thoughts and I can consciously choose to start to feel these different things, but you've got to practice that. Yeah, I, I, just, I, I, think, I think it has to do with self-awareness and, and being present, right? So yeah. negative stuff wakes everybody up. Yeah. Bad mm -hmm. shit happens in your day and you are now hyper-present in that moment because it, it rattles you. Good shit happens to you all the time and you don't even think about it. You're already, you're already thinking about the next thing that you're pursuing or you want to do and you're not present in the moment. And I feel like uh, mastering self-awareness is where a lot of this lies, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, too, like as you were mentioning your process for getting prepared for sleep, too, you had mentioned like journaling and, yeah. and, and sort of reflecting on maybe some positive things that were going on with your day. And, you know, do, do you feel that that's something that has an advantage in terms of being able to train yourself to start thinking those thoughts more often. Absolutely. There is a Holocaust survivor that I use basically his quote all the time. And I also have a technique that I, that I teach my, to my clients all the time. Um, and Victor Frankl um, mm. wrote man's search for meaning. He yeah. was a Holocaust survivor, had witnessed deaths, you know, family and friends. And he had this to say, he said, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. So understanding that we could always be in control, not react, but be able to see how we're reacting because our thoughts and beliefs, a lot of it is just, you know, society, parents, our upbringing, programming a lot of that stuff, even before we are aware from, from the ages of zero to seven. But we can be aware that those thoughts that are in there, that those old programs, aren't necessarily ours, and we could actually decide to choose to think differently. So there's a technique. When, when, so, when somebody comes in and they, they're, they're fiending a cookie uh, and they've got an urge for a cookie or they've got a negative emotion that they're feeling, like Viktor Frankl says, create space between stimulus and response. So I take 10 deep breaths in and out, in through my nose, out through my mouth. What that does is it'll activate your vagus nerve and it'll put you in a parasympathetic state. So whatever that is, that craving or that negative emotion, it'll actually drive that down. In that space where you choose, you act, which stands for awareness, choice, and then take action. Have the awareness, oh my God, okay, there's that craving again, or like, oh, there's that negative thought again that's driving this negative feeling. Oh, I don't have to believe that thought. So having that awareness first. C, choice, that's when you constantly choose, use your intention, no, you know what? Right now, I'm angry at my partner, but I want to show up with love, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I, I want to be a compassionate or, ge or a generous lover. Okay, cool. Last thing, take action. From that new space, okay, I want to feel this way. All right, cool. Let me then act differently. If you do that over and over and over again, you're going to train your body. I don't have to react of what my lower brain system says, I can choose something different. Now, that's the power there. Speaking into like uh, in, into your medical profession, um, have you noticed like so the placebo effect? Have you noticed people coming in with with a belief system and a positive outlook in terms of their success rate? Have you noticed any kind of substantial difference between somebody's attitude like going through and their outcome and their outcome? Yeah. Absolutely. So I would pay for a placebo that works anytime, mm -hmm. right? Because how we think and how we feel about some, something, like I said, a, th a thought and an emotion has biochemical you know, signature to it. It actually affects what's going on in your body. So if you start to think and feel differently about something, you're gonna positively affect you know, what your body's feeling. And those higher vibrational emotions, like I said, gratitude, joy, you know, optimism, all that has biochemical things that affect your bioenergetic state in your body, which will change, you know, how your body responds to things. Yeah, but you know, it's funny that the, the, I referred to my clients that I trained before that were doctors and we would have this conversation. I don't know if they would ever even say this publicly, but they said, you know, with decent accuracy, I can predict 
oftentimes who's going to make it and who isn't based off of some of the stuff you're talking yeah. about. Did you find that to be true? Somewhat? I'm noticing that now. So I, I work with, um, you know, I work with CEOs, celebrities down in, down in LA and I can, you can feel from their energy kind mm. of where they're at. Wow. Right. Interesting. You know, this conversation reminds me of, we had a conversation with a, a friend of ours, uh, Paul Check. And uh, we, we talk on the podcast quite often about the uh, the wisdom in some religions, right? Just mm -hmm. the spiritual, regardless if you're a religious person, yeah. you believe in all of their stuff, uh, some of the wisdom that is there. And I remember the first time that we were hanging out with Paul, who's not a religious person, and uh, he looked like he was praying before he ate. And I remember Sal kind of calling it out, being mm -hmm. like, wait a second, I thought this dude's not religious. What's he doing praying? And it really is the practice of creating that space before he made the before he decided to eat the food that's all he was which, doing which explains a lot of the value of a uh, prayer which is, exists in all spiritual practices Absolutely. It's, you know with the pray before you eat it's like well you're practicing gratitude you're creating space which avoids probably prevents you from overeating you're, you're, you're thinking also finding about, your way into yeah. that parasympathetic state you're thinking about is this food going to serve my yeah. body is it an ideal choice and you're you know yeah. a lot of times it, we eat reactive yeah, how many times exactly. I'm hungry it's the first eat, thing you right? grab you just start shoving yeah, how many your mouth? fewer pop tarts would you eat if you paused every, before you ate the pop tart right. to yeah. pray or whatever before yeah. you know creating you're... little tiny ceremonies really allow you to really take control of the moment um, and, and put some intention. I used to just eat on the go, right? You know, I, I only had like 10 minutes between, I had to run between patients, grab something on the go and just shove it yeah. in my mouth without thinking. Being able to do that, that, that you know, I'm not religious, but I do like sort of pray and I have this little time. When you put yourself in that parasympathetic state, you reduce, uh, you reduce the cortisol. You also cause your, your gut to be healthy, to absorb all the nutrients coming in. If you're eating in a hurry, if, if you're eating in a stress state, a stress state causes your... Uh, your gut lining to have these little leaky junctions and it could be an inflammatory state when you're actually eating. Mm -hmm. So uh, some people argue like, is eating a McDonald's in a calm state better than, yeah. than, than eating a, a very healthy meal <laughs> yeah. in a stress state? Yeah. We don't know. Or yeah. It also reminds me of one of the, the hacks that I figured out as a trainer when, you know, when you're trying to help somebody uh, through nutrition, right. And get, have better behaviors. Uh, one of the most basic pieces of advice I'd give them before we'd start getting into macros and getting real technical with their diet, I would just make a simple rule of uh, when you eat, no phone, no TV. Mm -hmm. Just the fact of you having to be present in Absolutely. that moment and not distracted yeah. by other things. People make it's better choices. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. how they how much less food they eat or better choices they make yeah, with their diet. Something you keep saying that I think we need to hammer home is because you know we're talking about this mindfulness and you talked about the acronym ACT and you said you have to practice. I think we need to talk more about that because... I, I think people don't realize that this is a skill and just like any skill, it needs to be developed. Like if you've never ridden a bike before, it's going to be really hard the first time you get in one and it's going to totally suck. So practice, you got to do this often. It's not going to work the first 15 times you do it, oh, right? Yeah. No. And I'm constantly practicing every day. I'm evolving every day. I'm like, Oh, there's that shitty, there's that shitty thought, you know, telling me I'm not enough again. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that stress going on again. And I have to constantly practice. And sometimes I'll let myself indulge. I'm like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I, I, I know a lot better, but I'm going to be pissed off for five minutes. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then I'll, then I'll get into a practice of bring, bring myself back together. But it's, it's, it's constant practice. That's awesome. All right. So that was the mindset one. And then we get into relationships. Yeah. Okay. So I read an interesting study actually brought it up on the show and it blew everybody's minds and i loved it because it really talked to the fitness addicted orthorexic type people that we see so much in the fitness industry something that we all observed working in the fitness industry is that we saw some of the worst uh relationships with food and body image issues in the fitness space worse than i saw in the everyday population so the study was i believe it was out of stanford and they showed that having poor relationships in your life was as bad for your health as, I think, smoking a pack of cigarettes or something like that a day or 10 cigarettes a day or something along those lines, which is crazy, right? It's like, it's, we know how bad cigarettes are. Having poor relationships, you could have the perfect diet, perfect everything. Those poor relationships, it's like you're smoking a bunch of cigarettes. So when you talk about relationships, what do you mean? What, what are good relationships? What are bad relationships? How do you foster the right ones? Yeah, so, um, you know, relationships basically you know, amplify any type of energy that you might have. But, ha you know, we are social beings. And there was actually a study done um, that's still ongoing. They actually started a study back in 1946, and they, they studied basically, you know, uh, Harvard-trained people versus people in the inner city, and they, they like, looked at their life and their, their lifestyle, and they concluded, you know, that 
um, it wasn't like cholesterol levels and things like that that determined the overall health and factor. What they had noticed that the people that were able to cultivate good, positive relationships are the ones that got the most health benefit, less disease and things like that. So good, healthy relationships are relationships you work on that actually put you in those positive emotional states that you, you know, relationships, the people you can count on. Um, but there's also relationships that can get can, can put you in those negative emotional states. Mm-hmm. There are there are toxic relationships that will put you in anger, resentment, fear, worry, and it's also being responsible. How am I contributing to this? Do do I need to forgive? And it's working those things out because it's those emotions that you spend a lot of time with. And again, emotions lead to biochemical changes that affects how your cells are. So being it relationships can really cultivate those higher emotional states uh, that we have. So fostering those things are important. This is a tough one too, because we tend to attract uh, people that protect us from our insecurities. So it's really tough for somebody who's in it to try and evaluate their relationships on, are these people good for me? What a great point. You don't want to deal with your drinking issues. So you make friends with people who also have the same drinking issues. When you were going through all of this and you got to relationships for yourself, Did you have to cut some relationships out of your life? I did. There were, there were, you know, relationship, you know, I like, you know, back in the day there, there were, you know, friends in college that, you know, were just party buddies and we used to always go, go out and party, party, party. And, um, you know, they, we went through a lot together, but that's all the relationship was based out of. And as I was starting to notice some changes in me and I started to say, well, you know, maybe alcohol isn't, isn't something that's serving me on, on a long-term basis. Um, I found myself not, you know, uh, enjoying the things that they enjoyed, and um, and naturally I, 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 I sort of had to let that go. Yeah. And they just didn't understand the process of growth, um, and and uh, of of me becoming and evolving into a better version of myself. Talk about this for a second, because this is hard. This is really hard. It was hard for me when I was younger, where I would have to kind of like cut relationships out of my life and but you feel a sense of loyalty to them a man i you know we go back so far and you know we did all these things together eventually the point that i got to was i could still uh value and respect all that but i can also value and respect myself and know that this isn't really serving me anymore but that was really hard like how hard was that hard for you was that easy uh, I felt it was sort of easy. I mean, I, I think I had a conversation like I'm not, I'm just not into this anymore. And then it just sort of naturally, like, you know, you become so busy. Like you now I got a family them. too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's actually the answer in the strategy. We talk about this with nutrition, like one of the, one of the great strategies that we do with nutrition with somebody, instead of taking somebody who has a poor diet and starting to cut foods out, mm-hmm. we tell them to add foods mm-hmm. to their diet, that foods that they need or they're missing. And we know that they're lacking. Yeah. Right. So as far as nutrients and stuff, I think the same thing, same thing goes for toxic people in your life. You don't need to make this formal breakup of like, Hey, you know, you're not growth minded. We, and right. I know we've been buddies for 10 years. We're right. breaking up now. You just fill that time mm-hmm. with people that are filling your cup. You right. start seeking out people that are going to level you up, that naturally are growth happens. minded, and then it naturally happens. Yeah. You're just busy versus this formal. We got to break up now right. because you're not growth minded. Yeah, the best thing I heard was that uh, good people celebrate your victories and mourn your losses mm-hmm. along with you, not the other way around. I thought that was a pretty good one. All right, so the last one is purpose. This one's interesting. Um, what is purpose and how does one find purpose for themselves? Oh, great question. So uh, when, I, when I studied this, you know, wh- why even care about purpose? Well, I mean, when you actually study um, what it does to the body, there is a concept called eudaimonic happiness. So eudaimonic happiness just means, you know, being happy uh, when you feel connected to something bigger or you're, when you're giving back to yeah. community, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it turns out this, there's a, you know, there's, there's that gene um of the stress response called the conserved transcriptional response to adversity. So th- these genes kind of fire together and wire together as the stress response. Turns out this gene patch quiets down when you've got purpose. When you've got purpose as an American, you live seven years longer than somebody without a sense of purpose. When you have purpose, you have lowered your risk of getting a cardiovascular event, which is the number one killer. These are heart attacks and strokes. Um, when you've got purpose, if you happen to end up in a hospital, you spend fewer days in the hospital. So all these health benefits. And if you have purpose, you maintain your telomeres. Telomeres are these things, basically the end of your DNA that prevent your DNA from aging or your cells from aging. 
So all these positive benefits on purpose. So the next question is like, how do you find your purpose? And I used to be like, man, I got to find my purpose. Yeah. Like being this analysis paralysis, what do I need to do? How do I show up? And when I started to study with some of my spiritual teachers, um, the process of finding your purpose is not really an act of finding, but an act of remembering. And it's remembering, when I look at my nieces and nephews, when I look at my daughter now, there's this state of natural joy that, that we have as, as kids. Mm. And that's just a very natural thing. And within us, programmed in our DNA, are the things that bring us joy, that maybe we forget along the way because somebody said, that's not gonna make you any money. That's not the, that's the, not the correct career path for you. So you lose that authenticity and you lose access to those emotional states. But those emotional states are programmed in you already. So it's finding and remembering those things because those things are your passion. And if you could share you, when you could share your passion with the world, with your neighbor, with your family, that community aspect, that's purpose. Purpose is also the struggles that, that's been gifted to you in your life so that when you have gotten over that struggle, you now have a gift that you could share with somebody else. For me, it was me having chronic disease as a medical doctor mm -hmm. that I could now talk about overcoming and what it took to overcome that. Your purpose is you. Your purpose is the authentic version of you and just mm. sharing you with the world. And when you do that, that's your medicine. Yeah. And purpose is, is, by the way, purpose comes with challenge. I, I remember this this art, this art study that came out and the articles totally butchered it, but the, the, the titles of the articles were all like, people without children are far less stressed and happier. This is what the, ti the titles of it say. And they, but you dig into the study and it shows that it's true. I got kids, okay. Le not having kids, definitely less stressful. It's definitely less expensive. That's totally true. It's definitely more, there's more leisure time for leisure activities. But what they didn't tell you in the study was that people with children have a much higher sense of purpose. Yeah. Very different than just being relaxed and not stressed, right? Purpose is a, a bit of challenge. Um, it's like some of the most driven people you'll ever find are people that earn no money and volunteer their time. And it's usually because it's driven by, you know, their sense of purpose. So is there a difference between joy and happy? Is there a difference between... Yeah, what is joy? Because you use the word joy. What right. is joy? Like, why use that word? Uh, yeah, joy is a, you know, emotional state that kind of like, you know, leaves a little bit of amount of serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin in your body that makes you feel a certain way. Yeah. I, when yeah. you say joy, it feels different to me than just being happy. It mm -hmm. feels very, very, it feels much more fulfilling. That's why I asked oh, that, I see, that, I see. that particular question. Yeah. I have a question. Or, oh, you mentioned uh, sp spiritual and, you know, something that is, uh, I think, accepted by a lot of spiritual leaders is that as humans, we have this natural desire to worship something. Mm. Do you subscribe to that? Do you believe that we uh, we have we are all driven to worship something? And even if you're a non-religious person and you don't believe in God, mm -hmm. Uh, there is something in your life that you're you are worshiping. Yeah, I, I don't know so much about that. I would probably at least say that there are certain things that drive a lot of people. There are certain things that like you know that people is you know is their reward and and uh, and they'll base their life towards that thing. For yeah. some people, it's so like going to be money. money. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Money, yeah, yeah. money, power. power. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Okay, so those are very good steps. Very actionable. Um, now you work with a company, you actually represent a company yep. that we just started working with. And I want to ask you this, some of the questions around some of their products because you're a doctor and also because of your background. So the companies live on. Um, uh, okay. So I want to ask you about their liposomal, you know, technology or the delivery method. What's different about that than other products? I mean, you, you obviously know a lot about nutrients and how they work in the body. You know why? Why use a product that's got that versus just using a normal tablet or capsule, for example? Excellent question. So, uh, first, let's ask. You know, how do nutrients get absorbed into our bodies? Right. So we ingest food. We'll start to masticate food. They'll come into our stomach. Stomach acid will start breaking some of that down. It then gets into your small intestine, where your pancreas and your liver secretes bile salts to d dissolve the, the fat. They'll have some, um, you know, uh, trypsin and other you know, peptidases that break down protein. And then once they're in their smallest form, they'll start to get absorbed. Now, some nutrients get absorbed by diffusion. That's a very, very small amount. Most nutrients get absorbed by a, um, a, a, a co-transporter or a cofactor, you know, sometimes linked with sodium. So it's an active type of transport. You'll, you'll, you basically have the, 
your your gut lumen, you've got basically these cells that line your your gut, and they have to be transported over to the other side, end up in your bloodstream, and guess what? When it gets to your target organ, such as your brain or your heart or whatever it is, it has to go from your your bloodstream now into that cell as well, also through a, an active transport mechanism, right? So some nutrients gets transferred over by diffusion. What does that mean? What is diffusion? Diffusion just means going from one space that has heavily concentrated naturally to, or just, you know, um, freely flowing to that next place. Okay. Whereas an active transport means you actually need some kind of carrier to carry that molecule through. So a lot of nutrients get absorbed that way. You need a, you know, an active carrier. So when you're taking, you know, anything by, by mouth, um, uh, a lot of nutrients will pass through the digestive system because if you don't have enough you know, active transporters, the rest of it actually just gets into your stool and, and, and out the other way. So a waste of money. Yeah, a waste of money. Or what exactly. we will say is expensive urine. Exactly. All right, so mm -hmm. one of the products I wanted to ask you about, because mm -hmm. I don't know a whole bunch about it, is glutathione. I know it's they call it the master antioxidant, yeah. really, really good for the liver. It perked my interest recently because I read its connection to, uh, I guess, people who, who've been infected with COVID and people with high glutathione levels tend to do a lot better. This is true for other viruses and diseases as well. So it's obviously important in the immune system. So what is glutathione uh, and, and, and supplementing it? What can that do for you? Or is that even important? Okay, great question. Uh, I want to go back a little bit to the delivery system, then I'll talk about the glutathione. Why I, I love Live On Proct Products is, it by, you know, you get a lot more absorption with this delivery vehicle because now what they've done is they've encapsulated the nutrient with phospholipids, which are exactly the same thing that's made up of our cell membranes. Okay. When you package it as that, when you have a cell membrane and cell membrane together, it's just sort of like, you know, they almost kind of fuse and it will just carry the nutrients onto the other side. So you, you bypass all that, you know, need for a co co-transporter to actually bring in the nutrient. Okay. So you're absorbing a lot more of it. In fact, one of the, one of the um, uh, scientists, Thomas Levy, I believe, studied six grams of liposomal uh, vitamin C. He was studying vitamin C. Six grams of liposomal vitamin C is the equivalent of 50 grams done IV. Oh, wow. Into your bloodstream. Because if you put it in your bloodstream, all that nutrient still needs transporters to get them into your cells, mm. right? But if you're packaged in into this lipid membrane, once it gets to the cell, it just fuses together and then the, the now, nutrients get why delivered. Aren't, why aren't all supplement companies using this transport system then? Well, great question. Uh, not all the companies have this technology. You know, I mean, there's only certain companies, I believe Live On is probably one of the first that's out there that has mastered this technology uh, of delivery. Is there, are there patents around that? Or yeah. What, okay, yeah. there is. Yeah. Okay. This I was, was a pharmaceutical, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was used in pharmaceutical drugs. Absolutely. As well. People use liposomes to deliver chemotherapy okay. and, and, and certain type of drugs just to increase the delivery um, of the agent that they're trying to deliver to the cells. Okay, now these are, you said pho uh, liposomal phospholipids. Yeah. So these are, is that why it's like a, kind of like a gel? Like a gel, yeah. When you when you take it, because in the packet, is that what that is? Is that what's breaking? Yeah, so that the the mixture of that is almost kind of like, yeah, that, that gel form is exactly, um, you know, what the phospholipids, you know, come out. Okay. Is, is that form, yeah. Okay, interesting. Now this, is, this would be different than just taking a supplement with a fat. So if I took a fat with a supplement, would it do the same thing? Or is it totally well, different? so like when, when we're talking about fat, you know, soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, mm -hmm. or K, if you eat fat or have some oil, it'll help absorb it a little Got bit it. better. But this is a little bit different. And so for water soluble, a lot of the water soluble vitamins go, need to go in with that, that transporter. Otherwise, it won't go in. But if you package it around this, this liposome, this li liposome actually gets swallowed up by, by the, the gut cell, spits it out to the bloodstream, gets swallowed up by your cell, okay. and then gets delivered into the cell. Yeah, now I've, I've supplemented with some of their, with some products from different companies in the past that are similar, like acetyl L-carnitine. I've used that for mm -hmm. a long time. Never felt it mm -hmm. until I used uh, their product. Actually, in fact, they sent us stuff for last year, and the whole reason why we even working with them now is I've been using it for a year and I and I don't feel it other in other forms. Mm, so yeah. it, it's it's the delivery method has to. Now be they have there's, they have three or four different ones that I've seen you bring in here with us and we use. 
uh, which ones are for who and how do I know if it's something that I need? I mean, I'm aware of things like vitamin D and magnesium. I mean, most people are deficient in those yeah. things. I mean, wh which of these are for who and should everybody be taking it? Like that's, how do you figure that out? Yeah. So uh, let's, let's go back to glutathione. Yeah. Who, who's that going to benefit and, and who should take something like that? So glutathione is the master antioxidant in your body. So, I mean, every time your body goes through any type of stress, whether it be a stress from a toxin, a stress from, a, you know, a stressful day, your body's going to, you know, produce these antioxidants, which will damage your DNA. So you need antioxidants around um, to help, you know, um, to combat the effects of that. So I feel um, it's, it's a good form of, our body, you know, having a detoxification system. So I think most people, you know, should be on it because most people will probably have some toxins in their life, go through some sort of form of stress. It does smell like fart though. <laughs> yeah, that's because Let's it's, sul it's sulfur based. There, exactly, right, right, right. exactly. So and, and they obviously put a lot of the money and research in, in how effective it is right. more so than if it tasting like bubble gum, right? Right, exactly. But but that, that thing works like gangbusters and I've got to hit a seven-year-old daughter who or bonus daughter who, who, who claims I fart a lot and sometimes I'm, that was just the glutathione, baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious. All right, so do that with my bulldogs. That's All right, now what about the acetyl L-carnitine? I, I like like using yeah. that uh, either around my workout. I did read that carnitine upregulates uh, androgen receptors, so that's what I want when I'm trying to build muscle. Yep. Any other benefits to supplementing with something like that? Yeah, so it it basically helps turn you know fat into into fuel. So it, it revs up your metabolism. It's great for the brain. Um, it is able to turn you know f you know fatty oxides. It works on the mitochondria to produce energy, and you know uh, you know in your muscles as well. Also be able to extract you know uh, fat energy energy and turn that into usable form to create ATP with your mitochondria. Okay. Now, so that's a very popular supplement in most pre-workouts now. You've been around that? for a long time. Right. And so do you see anything when you look at the, cause I, I don't even know the dosage off the top of my head, what a standard pre-workout carries as far as how much is in there versus the, the lipo brand, which is how, do you know the difference? Either one of you? Mm, I, I, as I far as the, no, I, I, you typically I'll go 500 to, to two grams. So 500 milligrams to two grams is typically what I'll, I'll supplement. And, and, and the, the theory is that you're probably not absorbing most of that that's in the pre-workout. Is that true or not true? Most or? likely true. Okay. Yeah. It just gets destroyed yeah. by the digestive system. Yes. Uh, now there's also, I, I, this is something I've just really now recently been reading about, magnesium three and eight. Yeah. So what, what are the benefits of this and what's different about it than... Yes, yeah, so there's different forms of magnesium. Magnesium like performs like over 300 physiological functions in your body, and this is something that a lot of people are deficient in. Um, and it's important for you know for, for your muscles, for brain health, for for your mood, and all of that type of stuff. l threonate is actually the only form of magnesium that will cross the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people use magnesium threonate. Um, to improve cognitive function, to improve memory. Some people also use it as a nootropic. Um, and it's great to kind of just like relax you as, as well. You know, if you've got a little bit of anxiety, that's great mm -hmm. for that as well. So L3 and 8 is the only one that, that crosses through the, the blood brain barrier. And the fact that you add a liposomal encapsulation there, better absorption into your gut, into your bloodstream, and then also the blood brain barrier. You know, what's funny about all this is that because this is, this is very interesting, right? So the supplement industry, uh, they spend so much time and money on packaging, on mm -hmm. flavor, palatability. Now, when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, the pharmaceutical industry has way more hurdles that they have to jump over in order to have something pass and also have something that works because what they're really competing against are other pharmaceutical drugs and is it going to work better or not? They spend, these pharmaceutical companies spend way more money on being able to deliver the medicine to the target area. Supplement companies spend almost no money on that. They spend almost all of it on packaging. And, and live on, if I'm not mistaken, started really focusing on the medical side of the industry and then moved over to supplements. Is, am, am I correct with this? I'm not quite sure the the, the, the history there, but I, I believe, yeah, they, they started actually developing this and wanted to get you know in with doctors and then like bring it out to the general public. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's very, very popular now in the general public. How did you originally find the brand or how did the brand find you? What did you how did you guys meet? Oh, great question. So I was uh, moderating the... Um, you know, the American anti-aging uh, in medicine uh, conference, and they were actually there. And then, um, you know, then I actually have a good friend 
uh, who actually knew the company and they, they put us together. I've loved their products since and we've, we've been, we've had a really, really good relationship. I mean, as, as a physician, you, you love to see brands that work and, and, and exist because they want to um, improve the lives of other people. And when you find that and you're in alignment, you're happy to be a spokesperson for the brand. Yeah, the supplement industry in general is a pretty interesting one. There's a lot of bad stuff that's out there, so it's pretty refreshing to find something that's backed or that works, you know, yeah. specifically in a, in a in a very good way. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a great conversation. It was awesome having you on the podcast. Hey, it was great Dr. being Vu. here. I love your story, and I really, uh, I really, really appreciate it when we find somebody that is able to navigate both worlds. And I hate the fact that they're separate, right? But mm -hmm. the, the Western medicine, there's incredible. I mean. No field of medicine dives as deep into specific, you know, subjects or areas of the body like Western medicine. But what they lack is made up for in the other side, which is what now where you're diving into that wellness side. So I love meeting people like you that have been in both, have accolades in both, because I feel like you have a wider breadth of, of, of knowledge and advice for people. So I appreciate what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me on, guys. Yeah, no thank problem. You. Thanks yeah. for coming on.